the East Coast in the United States. Uh, otherwise, good evening, good day uh, from wherever you might be joining us internationally. My name is Derek Dosenbrock. I'm a geotechnical engineer with the Federal Highway Administration, and I'm also a member of the ASCE Geo Institute's Technical Coordination Council. It's my pleasure to welcome you today to the first student research series. This is going to be a continuing series of live events where we invite student researchers to present their in-progress work on research projects. Uh, first off today, uh, we have uh, sessions uh, which have a theme of embankments, dams, and slopes. This new student research series um, is going to be a great event, so thank you for joining us and welcome. Uh, it's the newest addition to the Geo Institute's student activities. The student research series uh, recognizes the importance of collaboration, communication, and the role of the research community in geotechnical practice. It provides an opportunity for student researchers to present their in-progress work and the opportunity to practice presenting in front of peers and a wider web, audi wider web audience of professionals. Topics are going to rotate uh, based on participants' current research, and GI Technical Committee members uh, will assist in supporting and moderating the sessions. Uh, the session schedule and webpage for student participation and expressions of interest for upcoming sessions will be available on the GEO Institute's website. Uh, there are a number of GI technical committees. Uh, I'm not going to name them all, but you can see them listed here. Uh, so there is a lot of opportunity uh, for research to be presented in a variety of the subdisciplines of geotechnical engineering. We have a number of student committee partners, uh, the Student Participation Committee, the Student Leadership Council, and the Continuing Education Committee of GI. I'd like to take a moment uh, to uh, talk a little bit about our student participation fund. This supports GI students during our silver anniversary year. Uh, it supports student awards, travel, competitions, and more. Uh, you can join as an individual supporter. There is also opportunity for organizational support, and contributing is easy. Uh, there's a link on the GI website. Uh, you can also do it when you renew your ASCE or your GI membership. Uh, there's also a matching grant in effect up to $125,000 from Ed Cavazangian. Uh, so visit the website for more details on that. For today's session, uh, I'd like to thank the Embankments, Dams, and Slopes Technical Committee. They're the sponsoring committee for our inaugural session. Uh, for more information on the committee, uh, feel free to visit uh, their website link, which is also available through the GI webpage. A quick note, the GeoExtreme Specialty Conference is November 7th through 10th in, in Savannah, Georgia, and there's still opportunity to participate in that conference, and it would be great to see you there for GI's first in-person conference <clears throat> since the 2020 uh, conference in uh, in Minneapolis for the GEO Congress. I would like to thank all of our student presenters today, and I'd like to take this opportunity now to introduce today's moderator, Dr. Bina Ejmera. Uh, she's an assistant professor in the Department of Civil Construction and Environmental Engineering at the Iowa State University. Bina? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're joining us today. We're very excited to have you join our First in the student research series, I have the great pleasure of introducing our speakers that have been working very hard to prepare their presentations for this inaugural event. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to start by introducing our first speaker, uh, who is a Sina Faniede, who is a PhD candidate in civil engineering at um, focusing in geotechnical engineering at Aston University in the UK. Sina's research career began in early 2014 as a research assistant at the University of Gulyan, Iran, working on stability problems in geotechnical engineering. During his master's program, he was awarded the Outstanding Graduate Student, and his thesis was recognized as one of the selected theses in the area of geotechnical engineering. Now he's working on a multidisciplinary project with the highest score in the College of Engineering and Physical Sciences student Studentship Awards, for the 2021 academic year. That's focused on the application of fiber optic sensors to monitor geostructures. Today, Sina's presentation is titled The Application of Novel Fiber Optic Sensors to Monitor Geostructures. So without any further ado, Sina. Hello. Uh, 
Uh, could you please let me know if you can see my slides? Looks great. OK. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm so happy to have this opportunity to talk about my research project. It is application of novel fiber optic sensors to monitor geostructures. My name is Sina Fadei. I'm a PhD candidate in civil engineering with concentration on geotechnical engineering at Aston University in the UK. My main supervisor is uh, Dr. Mora Mehrava, and the associate uh, supervisor is Professor David Webb. I will be more than happy to uh, get your e email, any comments or relevant stuff related to this presentation in my email address mentioned here. Today, first of all, I want to mention the main goal of, um, of my research and of course different objectives. Uh, then I try to highlight the importance of monitoring soil water content. Uh, and of course, the importance of strain measurement for jaw structures. Uh, then I try to present some common techniques to measure soil water content in jaw structures, of course, briefly at times limited today. And then research methodology, and of course, the experiments, presenting experiments carried out so far will be next steps. What do you want to do today? We try to monitor and get better understanding of the complicated behavior of soil generally, the behavior of soil. And in that case, we try to predict its complex behavior by considering some contributing parameters such as water content, temperature variations, and of course we try to monitor strain generate, actual strain generated into the soil. And finally, hopefully we do believe that we can make an early warning system uh, which can help us to dramatically reduce the cost, effects, and even environmental issues. For this purpose, of course, we have got uh, five general categories, but today, as the time is limited, I just want to focus on the first one, soil water content measurement in different types of soils with different densities, and in that case, I will show you how reliable our sensor is. As probably you know, uh, there are two general factors can play a role to uh, change the amount of water content, soil water content. Non-local ones, such as uh, raining, such as uh, evaporation, and generally, let's say, uh, seasonal fluctuation. And local one, uh, such as pipeline leakage, as a common phenomenon happen in geotechnical engineering and, of course, infrastructure engineering. Measuring soil water content is crucial to estimate soil effective stress. It's a uh, really main item to stand against actual forces and of course any kind of loading. And here you can see some examples of ground failures due to uh, variation in soil water content in Scotland, Italy, United States. As, uh, as you can see, it's, it's clear that we may face really catastrophic conditions if we don't have enough data related to variations of soil water content. Uh, consciously, I prepare this idealized deterioration curve of geostructures structures to show you, uh, as you know, the performance uh, of our geostructures structures or general structures decrease all the time. And we have got three general categories for uh, maintenance reaction, as you can see here. But who knows? about any state of the performance of our geostructures. Who knows about the rate of variation? So if we don't have enough data related to performance variation, so we may face really catastrophic conditions. For example, these kind of failures impose significant financial and environmental uh, costs about 3 billion pounds from 2000 to 2014, according to the report published by ICE, or about uh, 64 million pounds only uh, during uh, about three months in the UK, according to the report published by ABI. As you can see here, okay, it's it's the common, common uh, decreasing trend 
that we expect for the performance of our geo structures or general X structure, as I mentioned, over the time. But in presence of monitoring technology as an early warning system, we consciously make an opportunity for us to be aware that it's time to tech rehabilitation. And in that case, we can increase the performance of our geo structures and finally face the life extension of geo structures. I do believe that it goes without saying that the monitoring of soil water content and strain make it possible for us to dramatically reduce the costs, fatalities, and environmental issues. And in this research, you want to use the sensor or sensing technology generally for this purpose. Uh, to talk about soil water content, let's put it in this way. Generally, we have got two general categories for soil water content. In geotechnical engineering, the gravimetric one and volumetric one. Even though there are some disciplines which use volumetric water content, but the main one in geotechnical engineering is gravimetric water content. But the only method which can measure gravimetric water content precisely uh, is open drying method. It's a time consuming method. It's constructive method. It's uh, only possible to do this experiment in laboratory environment. So in this research, uh, we want to make an opportunity using the sensing technology to capture gravimetric water content. For this purpose, uh, we use PMMA. It's a polymer based uh, sensor, which is sensitive to humidity and of course water content. Uh, then we use an over drying method to calibrate our sensor. And finally, uh, we use an specific probe that is common uh, in civil engineering project to show how accurate our sensor is. Uh, but before uh, presenting some results, I want to show you how FBG or fiber bracket grating sensors works. Sensor works. You know, here you can see uh, the basic principle of FBGs. Um, as you can see here, we have got uh, we have got grating, and of course the outcome of our sensor is bracket wavelengths, uh, which is depends on. Uh, which depends on uh, refractive index and grating period, as you can see here. But how it works? When an incident spectrum of light propagates through the grating, a specific wavelength named the Bragg wavelength is reflected back, while the rest of the spectrum is transmitted unaffected. When an external axial strain is induced, such as water content, temperature variation, or any kind of deformation, you know, a soil generally, or structure even, when an external axial strain is induced, the FBG reacts accordingly, as you can see, you can see here, causing a proportional shift in the reflected Bragg wavelengths. And finally, using this wall line formulation, we can capture the strain generated into the soil or any kind of variation that we are dealing with it. Now, I, I want to present some results that uh, I've captured so far. Uh, here is the immediate comparison between polymer sensor, uh, which we want to use in this research, and of course, silica sensor. As you can see, uh, the sensitivity assessment of our sensors to temperature. Here you can see that the polymer sensor is really, really sensitive to temperature variation. And for humidity uh, assessment, uh, sensitivity, humidity sensitivity assessment, you can see that we evaluate the performance of our, uh, of our sensors at two different degrees Celsius, 20 and 25. And you can see here uh, at 25 degrees Celsius, we have got a really huge shift for humidity sensitivity. It could be a really promising point for us to measure humidity variation to the soil. And again, for 25 degrees Celsius, similar value for humidity sensitivity again. Here you can see a polymer optical fiber bracket grating response to different gravimetric soil water content in lightly compacted soil samples. Uh, lightly here means that the weight of hammer in compaction test will be different from the standard one. And uh, here we have got different wavelengths for specific 
soil moisture content. So using this graph, you can capture any soil water content and you can monitor soil water content variation into the soil. Uh, and again, polymer optical fiber bracket in response to different gra gravity metric soil water content in a standard compacted soil sample game. Uh, it's a similar trend and here we have got a, another appropriate linear regression could be really reliable response for our sensor. Uh, to evaluate the performance of our sensor, uh, here you can see uh, the comparison between oven drying method, the value captured by polymer optical fiber bracket grating, and the common commercial prop, uh, which uh, commonly used in civil engineering project. The prop was used to measure volumetric soil moisture content, uh, then convert it to gravimetric one. The pro measures volumetric soil moisture content by responding to the change in uh, apparent dielectric constant of the moist soil. And finally, an oven drying method uh, was used, uh, was also carried out, an oven drying test, I mean, was also carried out to measure gravimetric water content. As uh, it's clear here, you can find out the value of uh, water content uh, captured by polymer optical fiber bracket. Fiber bracket grating is really, really similar to um, some data captured by oven drying method. Um, if you compare the value uh, by the probe, it's, it's really it's not acceptable uh, comparing our sensor. And finally, as a conclusion drawn from these experiments, I can say that continuous monitoring of changes in ground conditions. Uh, really, really, in this case, uh, we can facilitate uh, facilitate the prediction of uh, deterioration process of geostructures structures generally, a polymer optical fiber bracket grating sensor uh, as a basic for an effective, accurate and inex inexpensive approach to measure soil water content in different soils, of course. Uh, the sensor was tested at two different compaction soil condition appropriate linear regression captured, and the results show that the sensor is highly sensitive, sensitive to any minor variation of the soil water content as well as different soil porosity. Uh, of course, as I mentioned, uh, there are different parts, but uh, as time is limited, I prefer to uh, present only one section of my research project. If you have got any comments, any question, or any relevant relevant stuff, I will be more than happy to get your email. Thank you so much. Sina, thank you for that wonderful presentation. Um, we have a few minutes for anyone that has any questions. You can enter them into the chat function and we will ask them to our presenter. To get started, um, I will ask you one quick question. Um, I noticed that you looked at two temperatures, uh, 20 and 25 degrees. How does the sensor behave at much lower temperatures? Uh, of course, uh, we carried out different tests for evaluation of the humidity sensitivity at different degrees Celsius, but uh, as you know, there is a cross sensitivity for uh, our sensor uh, to uh, temperature. And in that case, we used uh, individual uh, separate silica sensor, which is sensitive to temperature, but it is not sensitive to humidity. And the, in that case, uh, we could remove the cross sensitivity of temperature to evaluate only humidity variation, humidity, uh, uh, sensitivity of our sensor. So as uh, you could see in that case, we could remove uh, the cross sensitivity of our temperature. Thank you. I appreciate the detailed response. Um, are there any other questions for Sina? Of course, anyone uh, who I have got any question, I will be more than happy uh, to get their questions, comments or any relevant stuff uh, in my emails. So if you did not have a chance to ask your question right now, we will have a few minutes at the end of the this uh, live yeah. stream to sure. ask some more questions. Otherwise, Sina had his contact information shared and you can reach out to him directly. 
So thank you again, Sina, for your presentation. And uh, we will now go to our next presenter, who is uh, Jack Cadigan. Jack is a PhD candidate in geotechnical engineering at Louisiana State University. His research focuses on geotechnics, geology, and geomorphology in an offshore and nearshore environments. He has been involved with extreme event reconnaissance with an emphasis on coastal infrastructure, including levees, dams, and natural infrastructure such as beaches and wetlands. Today, Jack will be presenting a, uh, his research titled Submarine Landslides on the Mississippi River Delta Front. Jack? Thanks, Peter. Let me share my screen. Okay, can you see my slides? Yes. Yes. yes? Okay, great. Oh, let me switch. There you go. All right, so you should see the slides, right? Yes. Okay, great. All right, so thanks again, and thank you for putting this on. I think this is a great opportunity um, and one that I hope continues uh, in the future. And so like uh, was said previously, my name is Jack Cadian. Um, I am going to be presenting my research on submarine landslides in the Mississippi River Delta Front. As I'll explain a little bit later, it's uh, part of a collaborative effort um, with a few universities, um, both here and internationally. And now I'm going to try to keep this very brief, so I'm going to move quickly. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free uh, to reach out and uh, let me know. So the Mississippi River Delta Front um, is that subaqueous area around um, the Mississippi River Delta. So when you look on a map and you see that characteristic bird's foot delta offshore of Louisiana, the delta front is the area um, in the shallow waters around um, that delta. And so there are three main distributaries of the Mississippi River, but two that we're really focused on, Southwest Pass, which carries most of the sediment load from the river, and then South Pass. And each of these dots represents an oil and gas uh, production platform. And you can see these lines are uh, submarine pipelines that carry oil and gas um, through the region. And so during major storm events like hurricanes, it's known that they can topple those rigs. So if you think about the economic and environmental risk um, that these submarine landslides can cause, it's pretty severe. So we went out in 2017, um, it was between LSU, the University of New Orleans, the Naval Research Lab, uh, the University of California at Santa Cruz and the University of Bremen. Um, you might see a familiar face there, it's Dr. Naveed Jafari. Um, we were doing 24 seven operations, 12 hour shifts, 31 multi-core, 31 piston core sites and 72 cone penetrometer tests. And one of the reasons why it's so difficult to uh, such a challenging environment here. So the sediment is known to be charged with gas from the biogenic decomposition of uh, materials transported by the river. When you sample it, the cores are rapidly, um, the sample quality is quite low because when you open them on deck, if you don't use specialized methods, you can have depressurization of the cores. And there's a lot of biological activity in the surface of these cores, and you can see uh, how um, soft the sediment is. So kind of a, mis mix a mismatch of really difficult conditions to get a high quality geotech study in. And so what we wanted to do was take sediment um, from these sites where we know that they're submarine landslides and do geotechnical testing on them. So we took uh, four cores from both distributaries, um, extruded them and ran undrained ring shear tests. Um, and we also ran them as a function of displacement rate. So it's known that hurricanes cause uh, severe landslides offshore, but we also know um, from repeat bathymetry in the time periods between those major storms that the seafloor is still moving. So the, the way that it's described in the literature for that area is it's almost like a creek-like flow. So if you think um, the average flow rate or displacement rate is about 0.19 millimeters per minute, which is very similar to uh, 0.18 millimeters per minute, which is a rate commonly used in rain shear testing. 
And so we we got the shear strength ratio as a function of displacement rate um, for each of the distributaries. I'm not going to go too far into the different uh, facies types here because it's not as important. But so you can see that the shear strength does increase uh, linearly with um, increased displacement rate. And typically, what you would expect is at least 100, or sorry, at least 100 and, and greater millimeters per minute um, for major storm loading, and somewhere between 0.18. Uh, to 1.84 subdecadal failures. And so the, the, the type of analysis that's commonly used for this is a limited equilibrium analysis developed by Henkel. And we will use the uh, conditions given at Obelxenol, which is a paper that showed that these submarine land slides are happening even without major uh, hurricane passage. Um, so we use the small uh, shallow wave from Obelxenol that has about a one year return period um, on the delta front, and um, the equation is given in Henkel to find the factor of safety for each, um, for a few different conditions. So here's the residual state um, with depth, and again, this is a very simplified analysis, but the residual shear strength line um, for all sites was relatively similar, and you can see that if you had a residual shear strength, uh, which would correspond to a pre-failed column of sediment, your factor of safety doesn't hit one until about nine meters of depth. So if you had um, a failure, and typically the failures that are happening in the absence of hurricanes are around three to four meters, you can see that you would be susceptible to having um, repeated failures. An undisturbed core um, at the annual creep rate is shown to be above a factor of safety of one. So what we're inferring is that um, for an unfailed column of sediment, um, the failure conditions in the absence of hurricane are somewhere between uh, these two lines. And so we did take, um, we took cores and we did multi-sensor core logging and we used the bulk density to calculate the effective stress and the overconsolidation ratio. So we know that the typical unit weight is about six kilonewtons per cubic meter. Um, and using the bulk density, assuming these cores are saturated, we calculated the effective stress profiles with depth, and we compared the shear strength that you would get by multiplying our shear strength ratio by the effective stress um, and the shear strength we got using the cone penetrometer. And for this cone penetrometer, you have to keep in mind that it's a free fall penetrometer and that the average um, error is on the minimum of 2.5 kPa either way. So pretty favorable results between both. Um, and we can use these profiles to identify areas that are more likely to fail or areas that might have failed and then been buried uh, by more sediment. And this is one example of that. We have an approximate age and shear strength. An overconsolidation ratio from that um, effective stress profile we calculated and the cone penetrometer logs. So what we see is that um, in the undisturbed site, which is one that we infer has not failed, uh, recently, um, there's an increase in shear strength, a decrease in the overconsolidation ratio, and an increase in the age that lines up approximately um, with Hurricane Camille. So a higher energy, coarser grain deposit that has a higher shear strength um, that would have to have been mobilized by an event as a, such as a major hurricane. In terms of looking for a subdecadal failure, we found um, an event that was approximately the correct depth in a goalie that would line up with one of those failures that's been observed, where we see a decrease in shear strength, a slight decrease in shear strength, a sharp decrease in overconsolidation, and a decrease in age as well. And that lines up approximately with around 2010, 2008, um, which was the period when there were strong Mississippi River floods. And so we think that that could have been a cause of those failures. Um, and so, again, thank you. I did try to keep it as quickly as possible because I know we're in the uh, eight-minute mark and it looks like I'm right about there. But if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Or if anyone wants to talk further about the research, uh, please send me an email. Thank you. Jack, thank you for your great presentation. Um, at this point, we'd like to open the floor to questions. So um, if there are any questions, please type them into the chat function on YouTube and we will be happy to, uh, I'm sure Jack would be happy to answer those for you.
to get us started, uh, Jack, I'll ask you the first question. Um, what What are the next steps in your research project? Um, so we're actually wrapping it up now. Um, next steps would be to get a, um, we have a lot of data um, that spans the geology side and the geotechnical side and um, merging that in together is what's difficult, but what you really need to do to get a better idea of these events. So um, the next step would be to try to develop a, a nice numerical model to simulate these failures. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. Um, so it doesn't look like there are any questions on YouTube at the moment, but Jack will be around till the end of this uh, presentation. So if you have any questions that come to mind afterwards, please put them into the function and he will answer them at the end of the session. Great, thank you. Thank you once again for your presentation. Our next presentation uh, will be from Raj Kiran Deeman. Um, Raj is a, uh, is a junior research fellow in the Department of Geology in Punjab University in India. He's completed his master's in geology from the same university in 2020. And his, his field of study is engineering geology with three plus years of research and field experiences. To date, Raj has published one uh, chapter in a peer reviewed book series by Springer and one paper, and he has one paper under review in the uh, Journal of Engineering Geology. Raj's future goals are to work as an engineering geologist in tunneling and in the tunneling and hydropower sectors. Today, Raj is going to give a presentation titled Slope Mass Rating Charts for On-Site Classification of Rock Slopes. Raj? Rush, you're on mute. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Dr. Bina. Uh, looks like everyone can see my screen. If not, please let me know. Yes, we can see your screen. OK, thank you. Uh, so hello, everyone. My name is Raj Kiran, and uh, I'm currently a junior research fellow in Department of Geology, Punjab University, Chandigarh, India. First of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, Geo Institute of ASC for giving me this opportunity to present my specific work in this platform. Uh, this work uh, which I'm going to present today is something which I did in my master's thesis and uh, I'm happy to share my work here. So I'll start quickly. Line of my presentation would be uh, I'll briefly discuss the rock mass and slow mass classification systems and then I'll come to slow mass rating system and its modifications. Uh, I'll come to status of SMR until 2015. It is a paper by Romana and others where they have discussed the, what is the uh, worldwide use of slow mass rating classification system. And then I'll come to the slow mass rating classification system and why do we need the slow mass rating charts? which is the primary goal of my presentation. And then I'll discuss the methodology, how I developed those charts, and then I'll come to the application part. As we are all aware that there are very famous empirical classification systems that are used worldwide in geotechnical and engineering geological investigations like RMR, Q system, GSI, HI, SMR, and currently Q slope is developed. So my primary goal in this presentation is to talk about slope mass rating classification system. And then I'll discuss the modification of slope mass rating which are CSMR, Chinese slope mass rating, continuous slope mass rating, and then new slope mass rating, fuzzy slope mass rating, and graphical slope mass rating. The status of SMR as per the paper by Romana and others in 2015, they have discussed that almost uh, around the world, more than 50 countries are using slope mass rating for classifying the rock slopes. As you can see in this figure that the light shade gray color represents the countries where SMR is used. 
and dark gray color countries are the countries where smr is used as well as included in the educational as well as the technical regulation parts so it is very important to understand here that slow mass rating is a very uh, important empirical classification system that is used uh, as a preliminary method before going into the large scale studies so it is uh, that's why uh, i have to taken this step to work on slow mass rating charts by developing the slow mass rating charts so if we can also see that the these countries in here south asian part that india and china the slow mass rating is very much used for preliminary investigation part so what is slow mass rating classification system slow mass rating system is developed uh, by taking a base of rock mass rating and then adjusting the geometrical relationship between the joints and slow face so that we can deduce the rock mass rating value to a slow mass rating value what why we do that we do that we do that by considering the factors f1 f2 f3 and f4 these three factors f1 f2 and f3 these are factors which are related to the orientation of joints with respect to the slow face and then f4 factor is a subjective factor which depends upon the excavation method that is used in the particular slow face so f1 f2 f3 and f, uh, f3 these three factors are basically continuous functions uh, given by thomas and others in 2007 which i used to deduce the rock mass rating value so i'll uh, explain f1 value f1 value is related to the strike of joint and slow face what is the angle between strike of joint and slow face on the basis of that this parameter is calculated and for f2 we see the dip amount of joint that is used for calculation of f2 and in f3 we see the daylight envelope that is what is the angle between joint and slope dips we did the we, we see the relation between these so i'll quickly go further uh, so let's see how smr is traditionally used and is traditionally calculated in the field right now what people do is that we go to field as you can see in this particular figure there is a hard rock rock slow face and uh, we see joint j1 and j0 are present and red line this indicates the intersection of these two joints uh, we what we do is that we go to the field and we calculate rock mass rating value by using the standard charts given by binovsky in 1989 we use them and then we calculate the rock mass rating value uh, for example let's assume that for this hard rock slope we have a rmr value of 75 in the field what we do next is that generally we calculate the joints j0 j1 and other joints if they are present calculate the attitude data and then make a data sheet for that and then we go to the lab or we we do a test study where uh, we try to calculate the adjustment factors f1 f2 and f3 using those continuous functions mentioned in the earlier slide and then we calculate a value of f1 f2 f3 and then we deduce the value of rmr value to a new smr value for individually planar failure wedge failure and toppling failure case for these three cases we calculate this uh, f1 f2 and f3 individually and then the minimum smr value that we get is considered for the particular slow phase that we are studying and then we provide the smr class for that slope this is a tra traditional method how engineering geologists are doing right now the work but uh, why do we need smr charts because when we are, when we are doing this work we are collecting a lot of data in the field like j1 j2 j3 and then we are going to the desk study and then we are calculating parameters and then we are coming to the smr class and all but uh, what if we can calculate the smr value in the field on site value this is what came to my mind and uh, uh, considering this as a base point for my research in masters i developed these smr charts so what is the methodology well, uh, what i have assumed that uh, smr since rmr is a constant number so by uh, deducing the any value of rmr like if i can get 100 value or 80 value of rmr the dedu deduction will be constant so i have assumed a constant rmr value in my simulation part for developing the smr charts and then what i have done is that i have generated 97200 combinations individually for planar wedge and then toppling failure case different types of orientations with respect to joint and slow face were developed in globally these all values were simulated in matlab and then uh, in this figure you can see that how i have done this i have used worlds within worlds method uh, and uh, in this method what we do is that uh, we consider two worlds one outside world and inner world in our outer world we fix any two variables and then we uh, in inner world we interchange the 
other variables for present there so i have considered two variables like uh, for example joint dip beta j is in y x axis and in y axis for example let's say we have beta s we have made them constant in in the inner world for x axis i have fixed rmr constant and then i have varied the strike parallelism value a from 0 to 90 degree so for every 1 degree value i have calculated different slow mass rating values by doing this i have generated so many combinations like here i have mentioned 97000 combinations by doing this uh, i was able to uh, uh, you know get a lot of data and then so that i could contour the data and get the final smr value out of these contours so then finally i got the smr charts for planar and wedge and toppling failure in uh, individually since planar and wedge they they follow uh, on the uh, similar methodology of functions and toppling failure follow on the dif different methodology so charts were developed for planar wedge individually and for toppling failure individual charts were developed i have shown here two examples for results uh, this is a case for planar or wedge failure case let's see this is a slope of 30 degree beta s is 30 degree here so what people can do now is that they go to field they calculate the strike parallelism value of j1 and then j2 and then j3 and then they put the j, uh, joint d value in the y axis for a planar failure case and for a wedge failure case what they can do is that they can calculate the strike parallelism between trend and the joint uh, and the slope and the plunge of the uh, intersection line and the joint d value so by plotting that value in this particular chart they'll immediately get the value of smr class because these contours are of smr value i'll show uh, in the coming slides how to use these charts and similarly i have shown the extreme example for beta s is equal to 90 degree like slope dip is equal to 90 degree here and slope dip is equal to 30 degree here in between there were so many charts are developed similarly i have done this for the toppling failure case as you can see in this figure let's come to the point where how to use these smr charts what i have done is i have shown here uh, an assumed slope let's assume there is a slope which have a dip direction of 50 degree and dip amount of 80 degree and the joints these joints are present j0 j1 and j2 with these values of dip direction and dip amount so what i have done is i have calculated strike parallelism which is simple the angle between joint and slope strikes that i have calculated here and uh, uh, similarly i have done this for the uh, planar failure for wedge failure i have used the intersections of trend and uh, slope strike and for toppling failure i have used the direct values Uh, there is one point that uh, for calculation of wedge failure we need to calculate the intersection of joints that we can do using the stereo net in the field which is a very common practice in geologists and engineering geologists and it, it won't take hard time so after getting all these values i have shown the smr chart for planar failure case see what what is here is that you can see this red diamond dot here j not this is value for j not because we have a j not of strike parallelism 10 and joint d value is around 35 so i am immediately getting the value of smr between 60 to 65 so i don't need to calculate the factors f1 f2 and f3 by going to dex study i am immediately getting the value of smr class in the field so i can provide the stability measures on the uh, on the field immediately because it is very important uh, especially in the developing countries where road widening road widening works are continuously happening and you need to give a stability measures on the site similarly i have done this case uh, for example in this particular slope we are getting the smr value of 60 and 70 so smr class is 2 here similarly i have done this for wedge failure case where two intersections are falling one is above 95 and one is at uh, 60 to 70 so i immediately get the idea that this intersection lies in 60 to 70 range so smr class will be 70 or uh, will be class 2 so i have also done this for uh, toppling failure case and in toppling also you you are getting the values here 85 to 90 that is class 1 for smr so there is no toppling failure in this particular slope final conclusion for this as you slope is that most probable failures will be planar or wedge because we are getting class 2 here and for uh, toppling it is class 1 so we can use romana's 1993 charts directly in the field and we can suggest the stability measures so what i have done is that uh, i have applied these charts in 35 slopes of uh, uh, some uh, 35 slopes hard rock slopes in uttarakhand district of northwestern himalaya and i have validated these smr charts as you can see i have a 18 km stretch from slope number 1 to slope number 35 and our results match with the observed data so finally the conclusions are that uh, smr charts are proposed through this work and uh, uh, using smr charts direct calculation of smr class in the field can be done without calculating assessment factors f1 f2 and f3 
so how these smr charts will be used an engineering geologist or civil engineers directly can you calculate smr class by just plotting the joint dip or plunge of trend uh, intersection line or between and strike parallelism between slope and joints that would be very easy because earlier it was like you have to calculate f1 f2 and f3 and it took a long time so these our charts will be very easy to use and they can uh, you know expedite the preliminary work of investigation especially in the developing countries where uh, national highways and other work is continuously going on right now so that's all and uh, currently i am working as a research fellow in landslide early warning system project in manikaran play this this is a place in northwestern state himachal in himalaya and uh, this is a place where I, we are going to install the sensors for developing a rockfall early warning system in india so that's all thank you so much you can contact me on this email for for the questions or you can ask me right now thank you <laughs> Raj, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, it was very informative. Um, we now have some time for some questions. If you have any, please put them into the chat function on YouTube, and we will be happy to answer them for you now. To get us started, um, Raj, uh, can you explain a little bit more about the differences you saw in your field uh, validation between your charts and the traditional methods? Uh, actually, ma'am, there was no difference. Actually, but what I can say is that in the field, we we collected data. That was that was a huge data set. We collected for 35 slopes, and then we had to develop Excel sheets and use those continuous functions, and then apply the value of strike parallelism and all, and then we can generate F1, F2, F3 value, and then finally get the SMR value. But using SMR charts, we were able to directly just immediately get the value of class. Irrespective of getting all those F1, F2, and F3 values, and in going into that thing, so that was what we were quickly able to calculate the class value of slopes. Now, wonderful. We had a question come in for you that said, "What type of rock has he tested in India?" Ma'am, uh, actually, uh, the rock slopes that I am working on, they are quartzites. Actually, quartzites. Uh, but for if you ask me the testing of that thing that is i think just one parameter in rock mass rating which is ucs so we have uh, done ucs part uniaxial compressive strength test for quartzite so that's it in slow mass rating we don't do testing because we are directly using rmr as an input i think that i satisfy the answer thank you um the next question we had for you is do the smr charts consider the quality of joints like the thickness or whether they are clay filled uh i'll again uh, again say that smr is the relation of joints with respect to the rock mass what happens is in rock mass rating already the condition of joints like you said in fillings or weathering or uh, what is the planarity of the joints that is already considered so we directly get the input of rock mass rating and then we apply the correction only on the basis of the structural orientation of joints with respect to the slope or rock mass that is what we do so we are already considering the effect of roughness or infillings or all those things. Okay, thank you, uh, Raj. Thank you again for your presentation. Um, Raj will be around at the end to answer some more questions if there are any. Um, in the meantime, we're going to move on to our fourth presentation. Uh, this presentation has been pre-recorded and the speaker is here available to answer a few questions at the end. The presentation is given by Purya Karger, who is a PhD candidate at Southern Illinois University and a senior staff personnel at Geosynthetic. His presentation is titled 3D Analyses of the 2014 OSO Landslide. Hello, thank you so much for joining us in this web seminar. My name is Purya Karger. I am a PhD candidate at Southern Illinois University, and I'm a senior staff geotechnical engineer at Geocentric Consultants. Here, I want to briefly present our study on 3D analysis of 2014 also landslide. 2014 also landslide has been known as the deadliest landslide in the United States history with 43 casualties and uh, hundreds of millions of damage. 
This landslide destroyed the Steelhead Haven community along the North Fork of the Slugwamish River in Snohomish County, Washington. Various researchers have proposed several and different failure mechanism for this landslide. And uh, that's because uh, there is a very complex geomorphology of the, uh, for the area, which is affected by uh, ancient and recent previous landslide. So the, comp the geometry of the landslide is complex and also there are other factors in terms of initiation that adds that add to complexity of uh, this uh, problem, such as a heavy rainfall uh, about um, in the 21 days period prior to the landslide and a very uh, large area of uh, vegetation harvesting exactly about the eastern corner of the slope, uh, which could uh, be a very important factor on the initiation of the landslide. Also, there was no available video from the occurrence of the landslide, so it made uh, everything possible in terms of uh, speculating the failure mechanism based on uh, the observations and uh, the evidence. This study is based on the initial study conducted by uh, Dr. Stark and his colleagues in 2017, uh, where they used the 2D limit equilibrium stability analysis and field observations to uh, uh, propose a two-phase failure mechanism. They also suggested that initiation zone of the landslide is located on the eastern corner of the ancient bench in the middle of the landslide, in the middle of the slope. I talked about the complexity of the landslide. This is the 2013 uh, LiDAR image of the area, so the pre-landslide condition of the slope. You see that this is the ancient landslide bench, very important, important factor, and also the area that is uh, uh, affected by the 2006 landslide, the most recent landslide prior to 2014 landslide. And this is the region, the initiation zone, firstly suggested by Stark and his colleagues, and then uh, confirmed by this study. Also, we have some stationary trains on the uh, western side, side and the eastern side of the slope, which are uh, important players on the uh, uh, debris uh, distribution of the landslide. Methodology of this study, 3D limit equilibrium stability analysis utilized here using a slide three software package provided by Rock Science. We did a detailed modeling of complex geometry of the slope using the pre-landslide LiDAR data and also we implemented the geotechnical subsurface profile, uh, including six, uh, six I mean, different uh, layers. Also, we modeled the complex uh, stratigraphy of the ancient bench. We used particle swarm optimization method for finding uh, the critical failure surface, which is an advanced searching method. And we implemented a Spencer method for stability analysis computations of uh, failure surfaces, with, which can uh, consider uh, different uh, forms of probable form, forms of slip surfaces. We used more column failure criterion, and also we implemented fully softened shear strength parameters obtained from the torsional ring shear test. Uh, to model uh, the advanced glacial, glacial local stream clay deposit. Here in this figure, you see the extent of the modeling along with three uh, uh, cross-section lines, which are shown here that, uh, that are highlighting the, uh, how 
the ancient range is uh, reducing by uh, moving from the western side to the eastern side. So cross section three, two, and one, and how the ancient range is uh, going to reduce when we uh, go from section three to section one. This is the complex geometry that I was talking about for uh, ancient bench. And the orientation is uh, 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 somehow rotated. And we implemented that in our modeling. After running um, the 3D analysis, we came up with three slide mechanism in two phases, the slide one or phase one, which is forming the eastern corner of ancient land slide bench here in blue line, and a slide 2A or phase 2A, which removes considerable amount of ancient bench mass, shown in yellow in this figure. And finally, the slide 2B or phase 2B that corresponds to the final stage of the landslide, uh, shown in uh, green line here. And also, you can see three views for each of these slip volumes. You can see that the uh, also, the uh, approximately the volume for each of these slide um, phases. The field evidence also confirmed the three slide mechanism uh, proposed by the three D modeling for this land slide. For example, the from recorded ground uh, motion data. By uh, a station about 11 kilometer away from the slope, there are multiple distinguishable peaks of velocity, which are analyzed by Hybert and uh, his colleagues in 2015. Um, from their analysis, we can see there are two acceleration deceleration processes which aligns with the initiation zone, phase one of the landslide and it's a collision with the colluvium material on the toe of the slope. In addition, Hybert and his colleagues suggested that there might be two major slides for the second recorded motions, this one, which uh, can correspond to the phase 2A and 2B of the uh, of the 3D proposed failure mechanism in this, uh, by this study. Here you see the speculative flow trajectories of phase one and phase two slide mass. Masses based on the proposed 3D failure mechanism, which aligns with the observations made uh, at the uh, landslide area. Also this figure shows the final head scarf of the landslide, this white line obtained from the 3D limit equilibrium analysis aligns with the one indicated by the after uh, slide LiDAR image. So we see that how similar and how close, close is the uh, results of the 3D analysis with what has uh, been observed and has been uh, actually has happened at the site. Finally, as a result of the provided insights by this study, uh, future LiDAR-based hazard mapping uh, should focus areas in which prior landslides like ancient big landslide has significantly reduced the support for the upper plateau, like 2014 landslide. Also, uh, it should focus on areas that are not steep over the entire slope bands because of a significant accumulation of colluvium along the slope though, but still may become unstable. And finally, the slopes that have been over steepened and are undermined by prior sliding, river erosion, and or other activities. For taking a closer look into this study, you can also refer to the paper published uh, out of this investigation in Engineering Geology Journal. Thank you so much for your consideration and your for your attention. Hope you uh, enjoyed this presentation.
Bria, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Um, uh, just a quick question while we're waiting for those to come in in the chat. So anyone that has any questions uh, that's watching this live, please type them into the chat and we'll, uh, we'll pass them to our speaker. Um, what are your next steps in this particular project? Um, actually, um, we are almost done in terms of the um, uh, talking about the failure mechanism. But, uh, and I have to uh, add that we also have done uh, another study on the initiation, exactly the factors that uh, um, might result in this landslide in terms of initiation, which has been published by uh, proceedings in IICTG 2021. But in terms of um, failure mechanism, we are almost done. The next step would be working on the impact liquefaction that actually resulted that damages a uh, downside of the slope and those catastrophic uh, kind of consequences and how liquef impact liquefaction happened as a, as a result of the uh, initial phase of this landslide. That's the next step of this um, case history study. Thank you. Um, were there any qu other questions for Priya? Okay, um, Priya, uh, maybe around at the end of the presentation to answer some additional questions. If you have any, please put them into the chat box and. Uh, He'll get back to you in our Q&A session. With that, we're going to move on to our final presentation in the student research series for today. Um, and this presentation is by Ali Sedagat. Ali is a geotechnical earthquake engineer from Iran who completed his master's degree from the University of Tehran. He's currently working on his PhD in geotechnical engineering at Clemson University. Today, Ellie's presentation is titled An Experimental Study of the Seismic Behavior of Geocell Reinforced Retaining Walls Using Shake Table Tests. Ali? Well, hello, everyone. Hello, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share my uh, screen. And uh, do you see my screen? Yes. So my PowerPoint is off. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for this uh, valuable session. I'm enjoying and I'm learning a lot so far. And as a last speaker, I would like to talk about my master thesis uh, project, which was an experimental study of geocell reinforced retaining walls uh, using one shake table test. This work was done at the University of Tehran under supervision supervision of Dr. Abbas Karanderzadeh, who was my master supervisor. But right now I'm at Clemson University doing my PhD in geotechnical, uh, more specifically earthquake engineering, uh, under supervision of Dr. Andrews and close supervision of Dr. Ravi. Uh, today I'm going to go through introduction and background of uh, this type of walls very quick, and after that uh, I'm going to introduce the methodology and test setup and finally we will go through the result and discussions for the selected uh, samples of uh, today. Uh, well, uh, the different type of walls have been used uh, in different uh, engineering project for different purposes like gravity walls, cantilever walls, we're familiar with this type of walls and also geosynthetic retaining walls. Well, uh, our topic today was about the embankments and uh, like the slopes. So uh, finally, after all these evaluations, like uh, whatever we talked about today, uh, we will come to the point of making it reinforced and making it stable. So one of the solutions uh, is using the uh, the any type of these walls uh, that it will consist the geosynthetic walls. Uh, well, uh, it would be after 70s that with development of in polymer science that the use of geosynthetic retaining walls especially uh, uh, was uh, more in practice and uh, they, they gained uh, more popularity in the different project. Well, they had a really good flexible performance and they were especially good in seismic areas. Uh, as uh, 
they, they, they actually had a good seismic performance in many different projects. But today I'm going to talk more specifically about geocells. Well, these are uh, kind of new type of uh, retaining walls. These materials have been used for different pur purposes as erosion control and uh, like in a slope, but as purely for retaining walls, uh, they are kind of new, the application of this type of materials. Well, uh, as you see, the general uh, elements of a retaining wall is their facing, is their reinforcement and the soil. And by using a juice, the idea is that what about merging the uh, reinforcement and uh, facing as two main factor of building a retaining wall. Uh, uh, so previous earthquakes, they showed a uh, good flexible response. We can see the, uh, some pictures here. The top left picture is from the Serkal Zahab earthquake in Iran, and it actually shows a retaining wall at, that has a sliding, and you can see the cracks on the road. And uh, experimental study also uh, were carried out on different type of retaining walls, especially on geogrid retaining walls. You can see some pictures uh, done by shake tables. And there is not so much literature about the geocell cell, actually. Uh, well, uh, I list some uh, that uh, some works have been carried out by Les Chineski and Chen and Xiu and the others. Well, Les Chineski actually, they studied uh, the real size uh, geocell reinforced wild. You can see the picture in the middle, the five different configurations. That's 2.8 uh, meter wall, so that's a real size with the real uh, material. So uh, it can be a, a point of discussion that what if, if we want to make a uh, like systematic uh, study and scale down everything to see the other parameters. So uh, in the work that I've done, the methodology was to scale down the geo cells uh, according to YAI rules. And uh, so the number was six and like everything scaled down by that with respect to that. The ultimate uh, tensile strength of these geo cells were 2.85 km per meter. Also for geo cells, the junction shear failure, junction peel failure, and also split failure are of importance and they were all scaled down and uh, calculated to follow the uh, similitude rules. Uh, and so a box of the uh, dimensions of 180, 120 and 80 centimeter liner box were used to construct the models. And you can see the box and me inside the box. And uh, all models were subjected to subsequent harmonic exercise is two main stages, as you can see the record of earthquakes. Uh, well, in the first stage, the amplitude is the same, uh, only the duration of earthquake uh, change and increase to study the influence of duration. And the second stage, which is starts from test seven, the amplitude uh, change with the same duration. So we can see the effect of amplitude on the seismic uh, performance of this type of loss. Also the saturated sandy soils, uh, which is called free school sand, which is the uh, standard sand used in the soil dynamic laboratory at the University of Iran for many different research were used with DR of uh, 55%. You can see the four samples that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, initially, I had six samples, but uh, due to the limited time, I'm going to talk about only these four. Uh, they have different configurations, and the sample four has uh, reinforcement, reinforcement of geo cells inside it. And you can see that we used uh, LVDT's displacement measurement in front of the wall to have the maximum horizontal the horizontal displacement and also the settlement to be three LVDT on top. And we had like uh, 10 accelerometers to uh, record the acceleration in different levels of the wall. And uh, another information is that uh, these walls, uh, according to the cost effective, you can see like the sample one, two, three, they have different uh, amount of geo cells to be used and the sample tree is the most economical uh, according to that. Uh, so result and discussion. Uh, sample one, uh, you can see the real picture of before and after the test. Uh, it's a three step uh, geo cell embedment depth. Uh, it actually kind of gravity type of wall and is the most basic. And after the testing, uh, the overtaining failure mode were observed uh, at 
uh, a base earthquake as big as 0.8 G. And you can see the deflections and uh, the lateral displacement of this and the propagations of the failure surfaces uh, during the test. Uh, the next sample uh, was uh, actually it was uh, the increment, the increasing the embedment depth of two last geo cell layers with respect to the sample one to see the difference. And with doing that, uh, actually the failure mode changed to bulging mode. Uh, with the figures uh, you can see with the lateral displacement and also the propagation of failure for, uh, failure planes. And uh, one thing was the uneven settlement of the surface of the wall. Well, this was done uh, as a recommendation of FHWA to increase the length of reinforcement uh, and the actually just synthetic material in the uh, last layers of uh, wall to actually take into account the seismic, uh, the seismic forces. And this model tolerated uh, 0.9 G as a base wall and uh, is also considered as a gravity wall uh, in this uh, series of tests. Uh, the third one is the wall with the uniform uh, facing. Uh, they all had the same embedment depth, uh, as you can see uh, in the pictures, and they could tolerate it as earthquake as big as 0.9 G. Uh, and the failure mechanism was overturning. Well, in this uh, sample, uh, the internal slip of the last geosol layer occurred. Actually, you can see from the figure in the sample three that there is a internal internal slip uh, that occurred in the geosol layers in the last uh, last elevation. And finally, the the last mode the last a sample was reinforced type wall. So we actually used reinfor reinforcement in three different levels, as you can, as you can see. And uh, we studied the seismic behavior. This model could uh, tolerate uh, an earth base earthquake as big as 1.1 G, which shows a really uh, big uh, earthquake. And actually, it was the best model uh, and best performance uh, according to seismic of this type of walls. The bulging like failure mode also were observed uh, in here. And you can see that actually the, the effect of reinforcement in different elevation height in the sample for uh, lateral displacement figures. Mm -hmm. And this table uh, actually is a maximum horizontal displacement uh, compared together. As a benchmark, maybe uh, I can uh, take your attention to test eight, which is uh, 0.8 G base acceleration. You can see from sample one to sample four, the maximum horizontal displacement decreased uh, with the different system and different configurations. Uh, and showing the sample four, which has reinforcement, the uh, best performance. And also, as you can see in test 12, which is 1.5 G, uh, it's only the sample four has a value of 3.85, which is still uh, in a good range. Uh, also, the settlements of the specimens were calculated, were, were recorded, and you can see that in the distance from uh, 30 to 48, 50 centimeter from the uh, wall face, uh, we had the, uh, the most uh, settlement, suggest, suggesting the, the settlement in that area. Well, these type of uh, structures are usually uh, used to construct another structure on uh, on top of the wall, the row of the buildings. So it's it's very important to take into account this settlement at very occurs and uh, see that. So in conclusion, uh, well, in general, geo cell retaining walls they exhibit excellent seismic behavior, uh, as in uh, even bigger squids. Uh, well, with changing the configuration of each model and with uh, that the failure mode, failure mode changed and uh, as I presented. And all walls compared uh, as seismic behavior, the geo cell reinforcement, uh, which was the sample four, showed the best performance in this uh, series of tests. Series of tests. And well, uh, it was just uh, a very brief, uh, actually, explanation of the work. And of course, uh, it's, it's more systematic work as needed to account for many other variables of this type of walls, like different uh, height of walls and back to back walls, different co configuration of the walls, and maybe different re reinforcement spacing. We only used one uh, sample for the reinforcement, and it showed actually the best. Uh, 
performance. So uh, it would be of interest to see the different spacing, different type of uh, reinforcement, even the hybrid walls using geo cells with geo grid and uh, or uh, other uh, stuff that could be done. So thank you a lot for your attention. And this last picture also is the real model of the wall is well constructed constructing it in the solid mechanic, uh, solid dynamic laboratory and physical modeling at the University of Tesla. So thank you everyone. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm uh, more than happy to answer. Ellie, thank you for your presentation. Uh, it was very informative. Um, I'm going to start us off with some questions while others type theirs into the YouTube chat function. Okay, sure. Uh, quick uh, you mentioned that you had six models, but you could only present four of them because of time limitations. Yes. So can you briefly summarize uh, okay. the last so the, two, the, yes, the two model the two, configurations? Yeah, the two other models will actually the change of configuration with respect to sample three, which was the uniform. Uh, I can show you it on the slide, which was the uh, which was the uniform sample. Uh, you see the model three. So the last, uh, the two others, they had actually different embedment depth of gel cell at top two and top three with uh, different embedment depth. So that uh, we could see the this model, which is the uh, sample three, how it changed with uh, making the upper upper uh, upper side of this model uh, stronger. I have the picture of that, but uh, I'm not sure I can find it right now to show you, but I can send you. And... No, thank you. I appreciate the, the brief overview. Um, any questions specifically for Ali on the chat? Okay. Ali, if I can ask you to stop sharing your screen, please. Uh, yes, for sure. Thank you. All right. So um, at at this point, we are going to open up the floor to questions for any of our speakers. We had a few that trickled in uh, during the rest of the presentations. And I'm going to start with the first one for Jack. Uh, the question is, are the landslides large enough to instigate tsunamis? Um, <clears throat> so these landslides aren't probably aren't high enough energy that causes tsunami and they're in relatively shallow water depths. Um, as far as I know, there hasn't been any historical records of a, of a landslide large enough in that area to cause a tsunami. And um, I know that there was a recent study that showed that they can be picked up on uh, seismic data, starting landslides, um, but I don't think there's anything that would show up even as like a, you know, like a small scale tsunami where you just have a larger wave coming in. But yeah, I don't, I don't think they're significant enough to cause a tsunami. Thank you, Jack. Uh, our next question is for Ravi. Ravi, uh, have you correlated SMR with Q slope method? Uh, you're muted, Ravi. Okay, so yeah, I got the question uh, uh, that uh, have we correlated SMR with Q slope or not? So we have not correlated actually because uh, our motive was to calculate uh, slow mass rating value, and uh, this was a project uh, undergoing uh, since 2017, and the Q slope uh, <clears throat> just came after 2017, uh, and uh, uh, now we we are thinking of uh, working on this uh, towards this that uh, uh, what should be the excavation angle uh, that is the main. Uh, output from Q slope. So yeah, we are looking toward uh, this by using Q slope and correlate it. Thank you. For Thank the you. Our our next question is for Ali. Uh, could we use those reinforcements for buildings with bricks made of earth? I'm muted. So, uh, well, the geocells uh, are usually actually considered to be used with the weaker soil, like the soil which have problems, like 
uh, that. So if I got the question right, it says that it could be used with the rock materials or the crash rock. It says for earth, so could we use the reinforcements for buildings with bricks made of earth? Uh, bricks made, of, so is that going to be like the crash snow material, yeah? I'm not sure. Uh, maybe uh, the person asking the question could clarify for you, but otherwise yeah, you can answer to the best of your knowledge. Yeah. Well, so uh, first of all, uh, the uh, geo cells are primarily used for weaker soil. So uh, because of the confining uh, effect and the, uh, the actually the effect that it has, but of course it's a little bit gonna be uh, of problem to use it with the brick material or crushed stone material as they are, uh, they could actually uh, have some external pressure on the uh, geo cells confinement and make the like the connection problem. So yeah. I didn't exactly get the material, what's what type of material he meant. Well, I, I will request the person asking the question to reach out to you directly to continue sure. that conversation. Sure. I can write, write down my email here. Our, our, our next question that came in uh, is for Ravi. Uh, what is the effect of seismic activity on SMR? Okay, so actually, my name is Raj Kiran, actually, ma'am. So yeah, I'll answer the question. Uh, uh, basically, uh, seismic, actually, seismic uh, uh, coefficients, they are not actually included in the fundamentals of slow mass rating. Slow mass rating is an empirical method, and uh, Romana, since Romana, it was not included there. So, uh, like I already uh, already mentioned before, that uh, these uh, SMR charts are used at a preliminary stage. So once we are going into the large scale studies, like at a one ratio 10,000, so we consider all these things like numerical modeling. We we will use all uh, all type of factors uh, that are possible to give a proper preventive measures. So uh, we have not considered that uh, until this stage. So thank you. Thanks. And sorry about the mistake with your name, Raj. <laughs> OK. Uh, our, our next question is for Puriya. Have you considered alternate assumptions for the soil layering within the slope? And could that have a large impact on the limit equilibrium method results? Um, no, we didn't change uh, stratigraphy other than what we had from the site investigation conducted by Professor Stark from the University of Illinois. So, uh, and um, yeah, that might be a, an effect, but we did that uh, based on the best uh, information we had about that geotechnical profile of the site. Thank you. So I believe those are all of the questions that have come in to our speakers. I wanna once again, thank all five of our speakers for their wonderful presentations. And at this moment, I'd like to turn uh, the floor over to Brad Keeler. Brad is the director of ASCE Geo Institute. And Brad's gonna say a few words about the Student Participation Fund. Well, first I will say a few words about this presentation today, the student research series. This was really good. Thanks to all our presenters. You guys did a fantastic job. I think one of the reasons we wanted to do this is to showcase the excellent work that our student members are doing to show everybody how bright the future is in this discipline. And you guys didn't let us down today. This was really good. So thanks again. Thanks to Derek for kicking us off and to Bina for moderating everything. This this went really well, I think. Um, Yes, I'm going to talk about the Student Participation Fund again. You will see I am wearing a t-shirt. It is not Casual Friday. I am wearing my 2020 Geo Congress Student Competition t-shirt because I'm here to talk to you about the Student Participation Fund. As Derek mentioned in his excellent open, we received about a year ago a $125,000 donation from Ed Cavazanji and a past GI president for the Student Participation Fund. 
This is a matching gift, which means in order to get all of Ed's $125,000, we need to raise $125,000. We are not there yet, but we are getting a lot closer. You have a lot of different donation options. You can give a dollar if you want. Uh, the thank you gifts start at $25. We have some very cool stuff. The latest thing that we have for $96, because we were founded in 1996, you can contribute that amount and join what we have called the 96 club every year there will be a different gift if you contribute that 96 dollars for our initial year it is a carl terzaghi bobblehead so you will want one of those to display proudly on your shelf or on your desk or somewhere where everyone will see it and be jealous and say to you how did you get that and you can tell them well i joined the 96 club and then you can explain to them that there is no double entendre there it does does not mean anything other than you contributed to the student participation fund. So with all that in mind, you can head over to geoinstitute.org and start your contribution or look for me on site at events. Now that we can start coming back to events, I will be at Geo Extreme in a couple of weeks with my trusty iPad and credit card swipe. So you can make a contribution there if you would like to. Every little bit helps. And it supports great activities like this, the student competitions at Geo Congress, the career fair at Geo Congress, and a lot more. So again, with all that out of the way, this was a great way to kick off this series. And I hope we will see every single one of you the next time. Look for our social media, look at our social media accounts for those updates, and we will let you know. Thanks again for tuning in, everybody, today, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you, uh, thank you, Brad, for those wonderful remarks. Uh, I just want to get a few thank yous out of the way before we wrap up the series.